everyone is, is signing on. We've, we've uh, engendered a norm of punctuality in this class because it's online since we can start. Um, so uh, last time we discussed uh, different ways of conceiving of the causes of death with a particular emphasis on health behaviors and on obesity in particular. Uh, we discussed the patterning of obesity by race, sex, and income. And we talked about various collected determinants of obesity, including social norms. And finally, we began to discuss policy interventions to address public health problems. Um, for example, like changes in laws and counter marketing, opening up uh, a conversation we're gonna continue to have in this class about what to do about some of the knowledge that we are uh, learning about you know, how can we intervene in the world uh, to make it better? Now, um, I wanna give Maggie a chance. Maggie, what can we tell the class? What do we have for our contestants, Maggie? Uh, what, can we, what can we tell um, the class about students the midterm? Did, students did very well on the midterm. You should be very proud of yourselves. And grades and comments will be re released after class today. Okay, um, that's great. And so don't be concerned. Don't, you know, play right, well, out. So we have a way to actually, the, the graders, when they added some comments, those are going to go back yeah. electronically to the students. Exactly. Right. Great. All right. Um, so today we're going to be talking about tobacco and to a lesser extent firearms and the structural determinants of violent deaths. And tobacco, as we saw the last time, is in fact the leading killer, the leading preventable cause of death uh, in our society. It's uh, just a devastating epidemic of consumption, a kind of um, blight of modernity in a way, given, given the tobacco industry, given how much tobacco is consumed and so on. And uh, it's a leading killer despite the fact that cigarette consumption has actually been declining since 1960. And the reason is that despite the decline, we are still nowhere near where we were 100 years ago with respect to tobacco consumption. So here on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is the number of cigarettes per person per year. And you can just track, you know, over the last 100 years, the explosive growth in tobacco consumption in our society. A little dip during the Great Depression since it's expensive and people were poor. Here's the end of the Second World War. This is the initial smoking cancer concern, maybe a little dip after that but keeps rising until the first Surgeon General's report in the 1960s. And then a bunch of intervention begins to, uh, you know, uh, so, so social interventions begun to appear uh, with respect to restricting advertising for tobacco, uh, a kind of growing understanding that smokers were imposing health risks on non-smokers, which was a crucial development in, um, in motivating public health restrictions on tobacco consumption. Uh, the use of taxation to constrain tobacco, something we'll return to, uh, and a bunch of other developments, including the so-called Master Settlement Agreement, which I may return to later uh, in the lecture. And there are between 44 and 46 million smokers in the United States today, and the prevalence of smoking in adults is still about 28%. 28% of American adults still consume tobacco, and the average consumption is about over 2,000 cigarettes per year, or about a, about a third of a pack uh, a day. But looking more closely at the period since 2005, and also looking at the patterns by age, we see that the recent decline in tobacco consumption is not uniform by age groups. And the youngest age group in which you belong has indeed been decreasing its use of cigarettes over this time period, though roughly 20% of you still smoke. So this shows uh, percentage of uh, current tobacco smoking in US adults by age group for, I don't know, a period in the last, you know, five, 2005 to 2011. Here's a percentage on the y-axis and year here. And you can see that overall tobacco is declining a little slowly, but you know, there's variation by age group. And of course, among the young, those that are minorities and those that are of lower socioeconomic status are more likely to initiate smoking and are less likely to quit once they initiate. Well, why does tobacco kill you? Nicotine, which is the key addictive component of tobacco, is itself not so toxic. Actually, nicotine itself, like in nicotine gum, isn't so bad for you. 
But tobacco contains much more than nicotine. It has over 4,000 chemicals and at least, at least 50 known carcinogens or harmful substances such as tar or the heavy metal cadmium or lead or cyanide or nitrogen oxides or benzoaprene or carbon monoxide or vinyl chloride or acetaldehyde or sodium hydroxide, which is lye. I mean, cigarette smoke has all these awful things in it and it damages tissue throughout the body in several ways, affecting multiple organs and increasing the risk for cancer and many other diseases. And in addition, the combustion at greater than a thousand degrees as a cigarette burns releases thousands of toxic gases and particles, which are very quickly absorbed into the body. And the organs involved in the absorption of smoke, such as the lungs and the vascular system, and in the excretion of wastes, such as, for example, your, 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 uh, your uh, kidneys and your bladder, are heavily exposed to these carcinogens. And so the impact of these toxins is very widespread, causing multiple diseases and insult to many parts of your body. Now, smoking and nicotine arouse very strong physical and emotional reactions, feelings of pleasure and relaxation and alertness. And it takes about 10 to 19 seconds for the nicotine in a cigarette to reach the brain and stimulate a release of neurotransmitters. And then a rapid behavioral reinforcement enhances the addiction. So I've noticed in myself, you guys have probably noticed that I'm addicted to this vice. And it's not just the caffeine in it, it's the whole experience, the cold can. I hate Diet Coke in plastic bottles. Like it's, it doesn't feel right to me. In fact, I've even done experiments with myself where I've where I put, fit, I put water in a cold Coke can and it's the whole experience of lifting the can, the, the, the pop of the, you know, like, like when you ignite the cigarette, like the pop of this little thing, the, the feel of it, the, the whole experience that uh, I come to become addicted to. And so what happens is, is the caffeine then that gives me that pleasurable feeling of alertness then gets reinforced by all these other behavioral properties. Nicotine causes the release of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and leads to neuroadaptation. Your body gets used to these chemicals in the setting of nicotine, and you require a replenishment of nicotine, else you feel uh, miserable. The brain develops more nicotine receptors because you're, you're taking in nicotine with the tobacco, and so requires increasing amounts of nicotine to achieve the same effects and a constant amount of nicotine seems to give less and less of a rush. And that is the brain gets used to the nicotine and it needs it in order to function normally. And it's really, really hard to quit even after getting a substantial health shock, even if the smoking is damaging you in some way. And in fact, um, uh, and in fact, nicotine and smoking are highly addictive at least 70% of smokers say they want to quit. Uh, and each year, nearly 35 million people make a concerted effort to quit smoking, but less than 7% stay smoke-free a year later. And most start smoking again within days. 40% of heart attack smokers relapse while still in the hospital within two days of intensive care. 50% of patients with laryngectomies try smoking again. A laryngectomy is if I've taken out your voice box because you had cancer in it. And 50% of patients with a lung removed for lung cancer smoke again. We used to joke, ha ha, when I was a house officer, a medical resident 30 years ago at the Veterans Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, that we would take a person's lung out because they had lung cancer. And then they would ask the nurse to wheel them outside so that they could light up a puff of you know, tobacco, even after such a, sub, a substantial shock. And more than half of heroin and cocaine users and alcoholics rate smoking harder to quit than heroin, cocaine, or alcohol. Well, how addictive is nicotine, in fact? This slide shows the results of a study of the subjective and physiological effects of intravenously administering cocaine and nicotine which were compared uh, in 10 cigarette smoking cocaine abusers. So they found 10 people who were cocaine users and tobacco users, 
and under double blind conditions, they injected them either with placebo or cocaine at three different doses or nicotine at three different doses in a kind of random mixed order. And then they asked the people to rate their highs and they measured different physiological responses after each of those things. And they found that compared to three doses of cocaine and nicotine, were, and then they compared the three doses of cocaine and, of cocaine and nicotine in, in this double blind uh, trial with saline. And they found that the nicotine high and rush was rated stronger than cocaine, although it was also less jittery. And the nicotine had a more rapid onset of subjective effects. And in fact, the nicotine was frequently misidentified as cocaine. That's how powerful a physiologic impact nicotine has in your body. And tobacco companies were explicitly aware of the addictive properties of nicotine and the efficacy with which cigarettes could deliver it. As a result of the lawsuits launched against tobacco companies in the 1990s, an enormous trove of internal industry documents was released as outlined in Alan Branch, historian Alan Branch's wonderful book, The Cigarette Century. Thus, we now have access to numerous internal company documents. And here, for example, is a comment from 1972. The cigarette, this is from a tobac internal tobacco company documents. The cigarette should be conceived not as a product, but as a package. The product is nicotine. Think of the cigarette pack as a storage container for a day's supply of nicotine. Think of the cigarette as the dispenser for a dose unit of nicotine. Smoke is beyond question the most optimized vehicle of nicotine and the cigarette the most optimized dispenser of smoke. This is from another document. To account for the fact that the beginning smoker will not tolerate the unpleasantness, we must invoke a psychosocial motive. Smoking a cigarette for the beginner is a symbolic act. The smoker is telling his world, this is the kind of person I am. Surely there are variants of this theme. I am no longer my mother's child. I am tough. I am not a square. That's old fashioned jar jargon. Whatever the individual intent, the act of smoking remains a symbolic declaration of personal identity. Indeed, the tobacco companies have become experts in the psychosocial aspects of growing up since so much of their business is bound up in understanding and exploiting uh, and manipulating young people to motivate them to start smoking. But they understood that young smokers soon got addicted to the nicotine. This is another document. As the force from the psychosocial symbolism subsides, the pharmacological effect takes over to sustain the habit. Now we care about tobacco, not only because it kills its users, but also because it kills innocent bystanders. And similar phenomena of secondhand effect of what are known as externalities, an external effect to a transaction, obtain in other behavioral causes of death such as accidents, alcohol use, vaccine avoidance, and sexual behaviors. Many of the things that we're interested in this course are public health problems, precisely when you do something like have unprotected sex or refuse to get a vaccine or don't wear your seatbelt or get blindingly drunk. When you do those things, you don't just harm yourself, you harm other people. That's what makes it a public health concern in part. And that's what provides us the appropriate moral and legal lever to intervene. In terms of secondhand smoke, when you breathe the smoke exhaled by others, this was classified as a carcinogen in 1993. It contains over 4,000 chemicals and over 50 known carcinogens. 60% of non-smokers in the United States had biological evidence of secondhand smoke exposure in one study. Secondhand smoke exposure causes 3,000 lung cancer deaths and 35,000 heart disease deaths every year. Almost 40,000 Americans die every year from inhaling other people's smoke. Surely that's not right. It causes between eight and 26,000 new asthma cases in children, 
between 150 and 300,000 bronchitis pneumonia cases in babies every year. Little babies inhaling the smoke exhaled by other people, hundreds of thousands of them get pneumonia. And two hours spent in a smoky bar is equivalent to you yourself smoking four cigarettes. And this phenomenon was critical in the social movement against tobacco. Because smoking imposes externalities, that is one of the powerful motivators to regulation. Now this, as I mentioned in the last lecture, is not obviously present in the case of obesity. It's harder to understand or see how a person being obese could harm others, unlike the case of smoking. And this explains why it's been so much more difficult to pass legislation with respect to obesity than with respect to tobacco. But obviously the addictive properties of cigarettes and the issue of harmfulness of secondhand smoke were key facts that motivated a public health response to smoking, focusing on the structure and not just on the agency. What does it mean to speak of your agency if you're addicted, right? If you're addicted to something, what, what rational power can you exercise over your own decision-making? So that addiction property, which means agency is not maybe less of a factor, plus the secondhand nature of the danger, which means we got to think about those around you and about the structure, both of them have motivated a kind of uh, shift to structure rather than agency and a shift to public health in thinking about this problem. Well, what are some ways to respond to this menace at the population level? How can we address the structure of the problem and not just the agency involved, especially if addiction is compromising this agency? And how can we do this, especially given the collective and not just the individual risks that the behavior imposes? Well, there are a number of things that have been shown to be useful for effective tobacco control. Taxation, I'll show you some results about that. That's very effective, taxing things works. Counter-marketing, I'll show you more counter-marketing that we just introduced the last time. Laws regarding clean indoor air and smoking cessation programs. Let's talk first about the cost of buying cigarettes because in fact, as those of you that are smokers probably know, a large part of the cost is taxes. And the rates of cigarette taxes vary greatly from like two or three cents per pack in Kentucky, it's a little bit larger now, to over $2 a pack in New Jersey. And in one study some time ago, in actually in 2004, the national average at that time was 66 cents per pack. And some municipalities add further taxes so that for example, a pack of cigarettes purchased in New York City, you know, costs over $10 when you add in all the taxes. But overall, cigarette taxes are still not at historical highs. So for example, this shows the relative rate of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of smoking. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, this shows the relative rate of, the, uh, of, of either smoking or taxation. And this shows year. And if you look at uh, the red line, which shows uh, the real excise tax, which is what I want you to look at, uh, what you can see is, is that the the real, in real dollars, the peak of the tax we imposed on cigarettes was in the 1970s. And it's come down and gone up a little bit, but it's still not as high as it was quite some time ago. And it turns out that numerous economic studies have documented that the purchasers of cigarettes are actually very sensitive to price. Every 10% increase in the price of cigarettes results in a 4% decrease in use. And this gives us a very effective public health lever with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with which to affect behavioral change. Here are the results from a specific study looking at the effect of taxes on the smoking cessation habits of pregnant women. So these are women that have a baby inside them. They should be especially powerfully motivated, this, this group of people, to quit smoking, and they are. And that's one of the reasons the investigators studied this population. Prenatal and postnatal smoking have significant bad effects on children's health. And prenatal smoking accounts for 20% of the low birth weight babies and is the most important modifiable risk factor for poor health uh, or poor pregnancy outcomes. 
And postnatal smoking after the baby is born by the mother, let's say, or some other adult in the household, doubles the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, uh, which is, you know, baby's crib death, baby's found dead in their crib. And it's a major risk factor for respiratory illness, middle ear problems, and asthma in children. This figure compares the prenatal quit rate for women in New York and Washington state where cigarette taxes were raised early in the sample period to the quit rate for women in six states that did not raise taxes. So let's look at the non-tax changing states first. This shows the percentage of pregnant women able to quit smoking while they had a baby inside them. So this is the non-tax changing states. So across time, we have a, a roughly constant rate of women able to quit from 1993 to 1999. And then we can compare that to New York and Washington state where taxes were raised on cigarettes. And here, both New York and Washington raised taxes and here Washington raised taxes and here Washington raised taxes again. And if you look at those states, you find that the quit rate has gone up dramatically across time as if this suggestive evidence indicates raising the price of cigarettes worked synergistically with a women's natural desire to quit and made it easier for them to do so. Um, and if it shows that the quit rate in the two affected states rose by approximately 15 percentage points between 1994 and 1996, while the quit rate for the unaffected states remained relatively constant. And the authors directly estimated the effect of cigarette taxes on quit rates using the same kind of econometric approach. And they found that a 10% increase in cigarette taxes increased the probability of a woman quitting smoking during pregnancy by 10%. This is a higher rate than the general effect I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, presumably because pregnant women are really primed to want to quit. So in general, we increase cigarette taxes by 10%. It might increase the average person's rate of quitting by 4%. But the pregnant women's rate of quitting might go up by 10% because they really understand that they shouldn't be smoking if there's a baby inside them. Furthermore, in this situation, two people benefit, both mom and baby. And the authors estimate that a 30 cent increase in taxes would have approximately the same effect on quit rates as enrolling women in prenatal smoking cessation programs. That is, it's just as effective to increase the price by 30 cents a pack as it is to bring people in to some kind of intensive program. That's a pretty easy thing you would then think of for us to do as a society is just to jack up the price for cigarettes. So taxes work really well because people are motivated by money. Unfortunately, people are also motivated by sex or fortunately, depending on your perspective. And the tobacco industry has a long history of using sex to sell cigarettes. So here, you know, Kappel's, Camel's goal of trend influence marketing is to attract and convert smokers in the trend setting urban scene. And this will have a lasting impact on club goers who will begin to associate Camel with what is cool. And so here are a number of, you know, sexualized ads for Camel that, um, you know, are kind of making it seem like a really cool kind of sexy thing to do. And here's some ads that are presumably targeted at young women. This woman is like camel, a pleasure, pleasure to burn. And this woman who's, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a contrarian, you know, she has this big tattoo on her body and she's wearing this kind of, you know, motorcycle thing. There are other aspects to her attire I won't go into, but, you know, you get the picture. Or here is another woman here that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, benefiting, let's say, sexually or a sexualized way from, um, from tobacco. And here are more ads targeted at young women. Uh, you know, ads can be seen as a smoking can be seen as a way to get men, you know, slow down, pleasure up, uh, to get slim, you know, to lose weight, the slimmest slim in town. And in fact, it's true that smoking can cut your appetite and result in weight loss, or apparently even to, to get French fries, right? Which is a different pleasure than sex. Uh, if I ran the world, calories wouldn't count. I think we're led to believe here that if you can smoke these cigarettes, you know, 
you can resist these, uh, these uh, delicious French fries or maybe eat them with less ill effect. Or smoking can even be seen as a way to replace men. Until I find a real man, I'll take a real smoke, right? So it's kind of, it's brilliantly capturing the kind of notion of independence and kind of iconoclasm and kind of, you know, um, um, kind of a rejection of convention in a way, even while it's really a conventional kind of a framing for what people are, what women are presumably interested in. And these ads seem more targeted at men, though it's unclear whether guys are really such idiots that they would fall for this stuff. You know, would, you, would he walk a mile for me? What you're looking for, or blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. I mean, <laughs> really, do people fall for these things? Apparently they do. So, um, and, and so for women, smokes can replace men, smoking can replace men, but for men, smoking can be used to lure women. And if you talk about arming both sides, you know, that the tobacco industry is saying to women, if you smoke, you know, you can, uh, you know, maybe have more control over your sex life and avoid men, let's say. This is obviously very heterosexist. And for men, you know, if you smoke, you can attract, attract women. And I, as I said, I'm not even exploring the heterosexism that, you know, is rife in these kinds of classic uh, ad campaigns. And here is the famous uh, cool Joe Camel campaign that was targeted at men, one thinks, especially given the phallic imagery of, uh, of Joe's nose, right? I mean, this is obviously a penis and, and testicles are very pronounced in all of these images. And alas, in a worrisome study published a few years ago, small children recognized Joe Camel at the same rates as they recognized Mickey Mouse. In other words, these ads were so widespread in billboards and were so you know, visually appealing that little children came to say, oh, that's, I know this character, this is Joe Camel, rather as easily as they could identify Mickey Mouse. But counter-marketing that we introduced the last time seeks to use these kinds of marketing tools like sex and humor to make smoking less desirable. And as I said, we saw a little bit about this the last time with respect to obesity. And here now are a few examples with respect to smoking, starting with Joe Camel, who can become Joe Chemo, right? Joe Camel does not look so happy anymore, uh, uh, you know, in these types of uh, ads that ape his um, situation. Or here is a revised take on the Marlboro Man, uh, making him look, you know, flaccid and impotent. You see Marlboro, impotent. And this is because tobacco uh, 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 smoking can constrict blood vessels to the penis and contributes over the long haul to impotence. If we highlight that, you know, maybe we will reduce the appeal of, uh, of tobacco. And these counter-marketing campaigns also sometimes take advantage of the health externalities of secondhand smoke. So this is like extinguishing lives right? So you're putting out the cigarette and all these people are dying or secondhand smokers are on the worst side of the cigarette. And you see this is, uh, you know, an attractive uh, young girl and, uh, and, the and the cigarette has been put in her mouth the opposite way. You're harming your daughter, let's say, if you smoke. Or here, you're harming your fetus, right? And we saw the responsiveness of young mothers in the earlier taxation study and they, in fact, may be a particularly a good target group susceptible to these kinds of advertising um, interventions. And of course, there have been warnings on cigarette packs too. This is the evolution of the warnings on, in Australia from 1972 to 2012. In, uh, in, uh, in 1972, there was a small text warning, warning smoking is a health hazard. It gets larger in 1987. Then we begin putting in 1995, big bold labels, smoking causes lung cancer, uh, you know, forcing the manufacturers to put them on both sides. Here we have to say, we, they mandated that the warning must be on 30% of the front of the pack and cover 90% of the back of the pack. And look at this, you know, dramatic image, you know, um, um, you know, really ugly, making the pack ugly. 
And then finally, the pack has to be completely covered in warnings. Here's a person dying. Brian died age 34. Here was Brian before he died. Here's Brian after he died. And people still buy these packs of cigarettes, right? You go and you pick up the pack and you kind of put it out of your mind, what you're putting your hands on. And incidentally, Australia did all of this in the same time window from 1981 to 2012 when it tripled the price of a pack of cigarettes. So Australia went all in with huge levels of taxation and huge counter-marketing to try to reduce tobacco consumption. And counter-marketing can also cleverly exploit disgust in street art or performance art. Here, someone just painted a sewer as if it were a smoker to try to highlight the disgusting nature of the habit. You know, it's like sewage. Or here is one of my favorite performance arts. So um, pay attention to this because it's it's a little subtle. Let me, you'll have to pay attention. Let me see if I can get you to hear it. Now, why is it not starting? Hold on. Media not found. All right, give me a second. Let me find. Stop share. Escape. Hmm. The linked media is lost in the mists of time. And I don't know if I'll be able to find it fast enough. What we could do because the lectures from last year are up is pull the video from the recording from last year for everyone. All right, maybe they can see it there. Anyway, it's another counter. I will attempt to do that. For you. I have it on my on my laptop because usually I deliver this lecture from my laptop in front of a real class and it's it's there and it's linked. And here I don't see it and I can't think of a quick way to find it. So um, so be it. All right. Anyway, it's kind of a cool. Actually, one other thing I could do. Let me just see. Uh, well, I don't know if I can see it. Never mind. Let's go on. Uh, let's see here. Sharing screen. And 13 and uh, presenter view. All right. Can you see the thing that's not working? Oh, Maggie, it's at thetruth.com. Let me just see. Maybe I can find it there. Actually, never mind. Let's go on because by the time we find it, we'll lose like 10 minutes. Anyway, it was one of my favorite counter marketing. It was kind of like those videos I showed you the last time. And it's really gross in, in certain ways. And we'll see, what we'll do is, is we'll put it on the class website. That's what we'll do. Uh, we'll put a link and you can watch it your own uh, later on. Okay. So in short, creative mass media campaigns can actually have quite an effect on uh, attenuating the appeal of tobacco. Um, but they're outgunned. Uh, mass media campaigns have been a major tool of health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, so this is a good public health intervention, but campaigns operate in a crowded informational environment and they're outgunned. The combined annual advertising expenditures by tobacco companies exceed $10 billion a year and the counter-marketing budget is minuscule in comparison. So the use of reinforcing strategies such as legislation, regulation, or building community coalitions actually is useful in having a greater um, impact. Well, let's take now a look at laws that are prohibiting indoor smoking. 
these laws were driven, as I said, by the phenomenon of secondhand tobacco exposure uh, and illness and the illness arising from it. And over the last 30 years or so, more and more states have passed comprehensive clean air, uh, clean indoor air laws, prohibiting smoking in virtually all public and private workplaces throughout the state, including restaurants, bars, and hotels. And clean indoor air laws actually should cover all public places with a special emphasis on healthcare institutions, schools, daycare centers, and workplaces. And all schools and children's facilities that receive federal aid have been smoke-free since 1995. So you all have never known anything different. And these laws have been shown to be highly effective. They reduce smoking prevalence by five to 10%, just making it difficult for people to smoke inside, reduces the appeal of smoking and the amount of tobacco, makes it easier for them to quit. 26.4% of smokers, 26.4% of smokers who worked in communities with strong ordinances quit smoking within a six month period compared to 19.1% of those in areas with no ordinance. And a smoking ban in Helena, Montana produced a 40% decrease in hospital admissions for acute myocardial infarction over a six month period. Just getting at passing a smoking ban dramatically drops how many people have heart attacks in this particular municipality. And finally, let's turn to some techniques that can be used on individual patients. As we saw earlier, of the 46 million American smokers, 70% would like to quit, but each year, less than 5% are able to quit without assistance. And the odds of successful quitting can be increased, doubled, or even tripled by using a number of these interventions, by counseling, by nicotine replacement, for instance, in a patch or gum, by certain drugs and medications, or by something known as quit lines, which are you know, 24 hour day phone numbers you can call, sort of like Alcoholics Anonymous, but for smokers to call people that can listen to them and help them you know, avoid the uh, temptation. Counseling can be effective, especially if financial incentives are combined with the counseling. For example, one study showed that providing financial incentives of up to $750 increased quit rates at one year from 5% to almost 15%. In other words, if I offer you 750 bucks, I can triple the odds that you'll stay off tobacco. And actually from a social point of view or from an employer's point of view, that's really worth it. Nicotine replacement is available in an amazing variety of forms, gum and lozenges and patches, inhalers, nasal spray. And quit lines are very cheap, but have a high marginal return. And increasingly they have high tech internet uh, equivalents. Unfortunately, insurance coverage for such interventions is still patchy, but on the federal level, it's not so bad. For the last 15 years or so, Medicare has covered tobacco smoking cessation counseling and also has covered prescription drugs such as nicotine, nasal spray, and bupropion, which can help people to quit. Some of these approaches fit within what is known as the harm reduction framework, which is discussed in your readings. So the idea here is that harm reduction, which is an important public health principle, it says, look, maybe we can't stop people from doing something, but if they're going to do it anyway, maybe we can do things that reduce how bad it is for them and for our society. It focuses on reducing the harmful consequences, for example, of recreational drug use, rather than necessarily trying to eliminate it. And this could include needle exchange programs. We can't stop IV drug users from using drugs, but at least we can stop them from getting HIV if we provide clean needles. Or condom distribution machines. Let's provide free condoms and decrease sexually transmitted diseases in our society. We all benefit from that, by the way. You know, your partner's partner's partner has the clap. Trust me, you would rather that your partner's partner have free condoms. Forget what you and your partner are doing. Just injecting these types of interventions into our society is beneficial for everyone. Or it's similar to designated driver campaigns. These are all ways in which we can say, look, you know, people are going to drink, uh, but um, people are going to use drugs, but um, what can we do to actually reduce the harm um, um, from these interventions? The harm reduction approach 
has not been widely adopted, however, with respect to tobacco use, despite its use in these other types of hazards. Nicotine replacement therapies have aimed at cessation rather than at reducing harms. And as read in your, as discussed in your readings, e-cigarettes could potentially be seen as a harm reduction strategy. These are cigarettes, some of you may use them, that deliver nicotine via battery-powered aerosolization. There's no combustion of the tobacco at high temperature, which tends to reduce its, um, its carcinogenic potential. And it's safer, it's not safe, but it's safer in many ways than conventional cigarettes. It also mimics the act of smoking. Here's to that. And could assist with overcoming the behavioral as well as the pharmacological dimensions of addiction. But it's unclear whether this will help or hinder tobacco cessation efforts. Some people are concerned that what happens when you make these uh, these e-cigarettes available is that you recruit younger smokers. And this is discussed in your, you know, that basically, yes, you reduce the harm of smoking, but at the expense of having more smokers. So overall, it might not be beneficial. And this is discussed in your reading. Now let's look a little bit at alcohol because it's a risk for all sorts of problems. And binge drinking is highest in young men, though it's been declining, but rates of binge drinking in women have been rising. This shows binge drinking about, among US high school students and adults by sex from 93 to 2009. And, uh, and here are boys has been declining and, uh, and men in this dotted line, you know, about steady, but among uh, and girls, it's been declining, but among women, your age group, it's been rising over the last few years. More and more binge drinking as women assume a more stereotypical, stereotypically masculine approach to, ask, to alcohol uh, consumption. And in fact, it's a major source of harm for college students. Roughly 1,825 college students aged 18 to 24 die from alcohol-related injuries annually. R almost 600,000 suffer injuries, but don't die. So almost 700,000 are assaulted by another student who had been drinking, and roughly the same number are drinking themselves, increasing their own risks of victimization. So drunk people are more likely to be victimized by others and drunk people are more likely to victimize others. It's really a social harm. This is an externality of alcohol consumption. An estimated 97,000 students are affected by unwanted alcohol-related sexual behavior. And a total of 19% of students met criteria for alcohol abuse or dependence, but only 5% sought treatment. And finally, an estimated 3,400,000 students drive under the influence of alcohol. It's really a major problem, but college drinking has proven to be a very difficult problem to address. And there's a lot of debate about this, which I don't go into in this class because I could fill like two or three lectures with it alone. If we had a more European style approach to drinking, who here saw the movie Normal People? Anyone see the, the TV series Normal People? Anyone raising their hands, Maggie? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. Anyway, it was a TV program that was popular a couple of years ago or a year ago. I don't even remember when. But it's about Irish high school students and Irish college students. And they're all drinking all the time. Okay. But what's interesting about that is, is that they don't necessarily have worse outcomes than our society. It's a kind of different attitude. Same with Greece, by the way, or France where it's very common, you know, the age of drinking or Canada, some of you have probably driven to Canada, who's you may or may not want to admit it, who when they turned 18 drove to Canada just so that they could drink legally. Any of you ever do that? Anyone want to admit it? If we were in a real class, what I would do is I would turn my back and I'd have you raise your hands and have Maggie count how many of you raised your hands. Anyway, the point is, there's a big debate about whether a more grown up perspective on alcohol consumption, a more normalized, it made it less prohibited and provided more social support where you know people would, would not let drunkards drive, for example. If we didn't drive it underground, whether we'd be better off. It's a huge literature on this topic. And honestly, I don't know what stand to take on it. Plus there's the whole 
ethical moral issue, which is if we allow you to enlist in the military or allow you to own a gun or allow you to vote when you're 18, why do we prevent you from having a beer when you're 18? And yet it's harmful as this slide shows. So it's, it's not an easy topic. Finally I'd, like to, finally, I'd like to talk to you about firearms, and then I'm going to close with some important big ideas uh, uh, for this section of the class. Because I'd like to make some remarks about firearms in public health. Firearm homicide rates for young men in the United States are between 10 and 300 times the rates for other industrialized nations, whereas non-firearm homicide rates are only between two and 10 times greater than other countries. In other words, using knives and, uh, I don't know, clubs or fists, our young men don't kill too many more other people compared to young men in other countries. But using guns, we kill between 10 and 300 times as many other people. And the reason, of course, is that guns have not replaced other violence. The United States is only slightly intrinsically more violent than other countries. It's just that the access to guns makes it so much easier for us to kill each other. Here are some data on homicides in young people in different countries. This shows the mechanisms of murder among 15 to 24 year olds in seven countries. This shows the deaths due to firearms, due to cutting or piercing other people or other kinds of deaths. Here's Canada, England, France, Israel, Norway, and Scotland. And the big difference between us and everyone else is that we kill each other with guns, right? If you look, for example, at, at stabbings, stabbings are, you know, not so different from country to country or other types of killings. The white bar is not so different, but guns, big difference. We kill each other with guns. In Japan, these numbers are close to zero. There's like, you can count on one hand the number of murders in Japan by guns every year. And yet in our society, there are thousands of them. Um, so this is a very important um, public health threat as far as I'm concerned um, in our country. Uh, the Kellerman study uh, that was in your readings gives you a feel for the frequency and age and race distribution and not just deaths uh, of not just deaths, but more broadly, injuries due to firearms in the United States. This study defined an injury as resulting from the discharge of a firearm prompting emergency medical attention. So the gun was discharged and something bad happened to the person and they had to go to the ER. That was considered a firearm injury. And overall in the three cities studied, which were Seattle, Memphis and Galveston, Texas, there were between 110 and 160 injuries due to firearms per 100,000 people per year, or somewhat over one per thousand people each year. 88% of the injuries occurred during assault, 7% during suicide attempts, and 4% were unintentional. And overall, 19% of the injuries were fatal. But look at the variation by age and race and ethnicity. So this is now by race, uh, non-Hispanic white, or by group rather, uh, non-Hispanic white, uh, male or female, black male or female, or Hispanic male or female. So this is race and gender here on the X, on this, on the, on the rows. And here is age in years on the columns. And let's look at the fraction or the percentage cases per 100,000 person years, uh, according to age, race, or, uh, or ethnic group and sex. So for example, among non-Hispanic white males, you know, there's six per 100,000 firearm related injuries in the zero to 14 group. And it rises with age. And you know men are more likely to be injured than women for all races. But if you look at black groups, they are substantially 10 times higher to be injured than white groups in this age range. These little babies, by the way, are not shooting each other, right? They're being injured by other people. And look what happens in this age group. If you look at the, the, the late rate of injury among African-American men in this young age group, 15 to 29, it's 2,000 per 100,000. 2% of black men in this age group are injured by firearms every year. 
it's just an astonishing rate of public health harm in our society. So men are obviously more violent than women, but they're also victims of more violence, okay? So we're here, we're talking about being injured. We're not talking about the perpetrators, we're talking about who is harmed. So here we see that men are more likely to be harmed than women by guns. Blacks are more likely to be harmed uh, by, than whites by guns. And um, this age group is especially more likely to be harmed than other age groups in our kind of standard approach to understanding the social stratification of this public health problem. And numerous epidemiological studies of diverse designs have confirmed that gun availability increases successful suicides and homicides and hence death. I reject this idea that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Yes, that's of course true. The gun didn't self-ignite. However, without guns, we would be much less deadly. It's much harder to kill someone without a gun uh, or to kill yourself, frankly, without a gun. This slide shows the rates of household firearm ownership. Now, incidentally, this is not always the case. Yes, the Israelis and the Swiss are very heavily armed societies but they have all kinds of restrictions on what you can do with respect to those guns. It's not quite the same as the United States. So Vermont, for example, has very heavily, very great uh, households with firearms in Vermont is very high. So this shows rates of household firearm ownership and rates of suicide, firearm suicide and non-firearm suicide in seven Northeast states. So Vermont has the highest prevalence of firearms in households down to New Jersey, which is 12%. Now let's look at suicides per 100,000, you know, there's some variation here, but firearm suicides much higher because it's easier to kill yourself with guns. And non-firearm suicides, not so variable. So the non-firearm suicides are roughly the same across the states, but the firearm suicides are very different in a way that tracks, it's not an experiment, it's not definitive, but it's very suggestive that the availability of guns is what's making the difference. And I think it should be possible to treat guns as a threat to public safety and to regulate them. I'm not saying we need to eliminate guns from our society, though I wouldn't be opposed to that. But I definitely think if we're gonna keep the guns, which I think we are, we should regulate them. And there would appear to be wide support for regulation, including among gun owners. So this shows support among respondents for the regulation of guns as consumer products among all respondents or among respondents who own guns, because most gun owners are not stupid. They know that guns are deadly weapons and they treat them with respect and safely. So most gun owners know what they are doing when it comes to guns and actually don't object to common sense regulations. Should the gun design be regulated? Should there be the same standard for domestic guns as for imported guns? I mean, why shouldn't there be? Should we childproof new handguns? Okay, we understand we have old guns. What about new guns? Should we have personalization of handguns so only the rightful owner of the gun can, can discharge it? Should we have magazine safety for all new pistols? Or should we have a loaded chamber indicator for all new handguns? Even the majority, you know, this is like an indicator on the gun that shows that there's a, there's a bullet in the uh, chamber. And in fact, the success in the United States in reducing motor vehicle accidents and we have now one of the lowest rates of death per vehicle mile in the world. Our society has done incredibly well at coping with motor vehicle accidents by all kinds of regulations, rules, and interventions. That success provides insight into methods that could reduce firearm injuries. Now in the 1950s, efforts to reduce motor vehicle injuries focused on the driver and the data were interpreted to suggest that almost all automobile, cra automobile crashes were caused by some error on the driver's part. And the greatest attention was thus paid to education and enforcement, training motorists to drive better and punishing them for committing safety violations. And this is similar to the medical harm and patient safety movements we described earlier. In other words, the focus was on the agency of the driver and on having the driver feel responsible for, the for an accident and had a kind of blame, blame the driver kind of approach. But eventually, injury control experts recognized that to increase the safety of driving, 
it would be more cost effective to try to change the vehicle and the highway environment rather than try to change human behavior. And this was a shift from a focus on agency to a focus on structure. And so numerous alterations were made, both in cars and in roads, over the course of your lifetime and my lifetime, that made collisions less likely to occur. Better brakes were mandated. Highways were all divided. So the two, two lanes of traffic couldn't crash into each other. So everyone was moving in the same direction. And to make serious injuries more avoidable, if there was a collision, there were collapsible steering columns, non-rupturable gas tanks, breakaway roadway signs. So if you hit a roadway sign, it would break away and more advanced emergency medical systems to pick you up if you were damaged and so on. Actually, nobody believes that today's drivers are more careful than drivers from the 1950s. Yet the number of motor vehicle fatalities per mile has been reduced by more than 75% in that last half century. So firearms, like motor vehicles, lawnmowers, and chainsaws are consumer products that can cause injury. And the safety of virtually every consumer product is regulated by federal and state governments. And the conspicuous exception is the gun. Unfortunately, as Hemingway notes in your readings, because firearms have been deliberately exempted from the oversight of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, we are in the indefensible position of having stronger consumer protection standards for toy guns and even for teddy bears than for real guns. Like we regulate toy guns more than we regulate real guns. And I understand the Second Amendment argument, but I am not saying we need to have a legal debate about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. I'm saying we can have a public health debate about how to make these products safer and what regulatory regime would make the most sense as a society. And in fact, there's a striking disparity in spending regarding this cause of death, even compared to motor vehicle accidents, let alone the disease-focused way of seeing the causes of death I said earlier. This slide shows the mortality rate versus research funding for 30 leading causes of death in the United States. So here on the y-axis is funding, and on the x-axis is the mortality rate. So for example, cancer and heart disease kill a lot of people and they get a lot of funding. HIV uh, doesn't kill as many people, but it gets a lot of funding. And you can look at all these other kinds of causes of death, including, for example, gun violence. And gun violence kills a lot of people per capita and has one of the lowest funding rates in our society. Compared with other leading causes of death, gun violence was associated with substantially less funding than predicted based on its mortality. It had 1.6% of the funding predicted from this regression analysis. In other words, it, if you gave it enough money as you would expect by fitting these causes of death to these funding rates, it should be getting $1.4 billion a year of funding and yet it only gets 22 million. In fact, gun violence killed as many people uh, as sepsis, which is a bloodborne infection, but the funding for gun violence was less than 1% of that for sepsis. Overall, in relation to mortality rates, gun violence research was the second least funded cause of death after falls. Believe it or not, falls are actually quite deadly in the elderly. It's easy to laugh about falls, but it's no joke. Many of you have, will have either have had a grandparent or will have a grandparent that dies of a fall. And fall prevention by removing rugs in households or providing banisters or thinking about osteoporosis, which makes the bones more prone to breakage, is actually public health 101 kind of stuff and well worth the money we might spend on it. And this, this low level of funding for gun violence uh, arises in part from a powerful lobby that has stopped Congress from funding such research, although in the last few years, this may be changing. So finally, here is another well-known, super well-known, this is a famous case in public health of how structure can affect agency similar to the gun control example. 
for a variety of reasons related to how natural gas was produced in this time period from 55 to 75, uh, which shifted from coal to North Sea sources, the carbon monoxide content of the gas declined. So this shows the percentage of carbon monoxide in domestic gas in England from 55 to 75. And it's showing that just because of the shift in how the natural gas was produced, the, the proportion of carbon monoxide in the gas declined. And here's what happened when this change was made. This shows suicide rates by mode of death in England. And it shows declining carbon uh, in the setting of declining carbon monoxide uh, in gas. So here shows male and female. And this shows the rates per 100,000 of male suicides. And this shows the rate of non-carbon monoxide suicides in men, which is roughly flat. And it shows the carbon monoxide deaths plummeting such that the overall suicides also plummets. Just like the gun example I gave you a few minutes ago. When we change the structure, we remove the carbon dioxide from, I'm sorry, the carbon monoxide from the natural gas, we make it very difficult for people to kill themselves with carbon monoxide. And guess what? They stop killing themselves that way and they don't replace it with another way of killing themselves. And something similar is seen uh, in women as well as shown on the right. Um, there were 2,499 suicides in 1960 from carbon monoxide. And in 1977, there were just eight. Overall, suicide rates declined from 14 to 10 for males and from nine to 6.5 for females. Motor vehicle exhaust uh, studies, uh, motor, motor vehicle exhaust studies also suggest that catalytic converters have decreased the rate of carbon monoxide suicides in the United States. When we added catalytic converters to our cars, we made it harder for people to kill themselves using carbon monoxide. And this is likely, this example is just like the suicide nets at the Golden Gate Bridge that we discussed the very first day. It's a structural intervention that helps prevent people from killing themselves and similar things could be done with guns. So what's our national report card for all the behavior changes we discussed today and last time? This shows the impact of behavioral changes on life expectancy from 1960 to 2010. And I don't think I assigned this as your, one of your readings, but the punchline is here. It shows the declines in smoking, motor vehicle fatalities, and heavy drinking increase life expectancy. So this shows the change in life expectancy in years because of the decline in smoking, because we've made motor vehicles safer, and because we've, uh, we've improved or decreased the consumption of alcohol. On the other hand, there's been an increase in obesity, poisonings, and firearm deaths, which decrease life expectancy, so that our net benefit is right around here. These are the uh, public health behavioral factors we've been considering the last two lectures, a kind of report card on what we're doing well in terms of addressing these preventable causes of death and what we're not doing so well in. We're doing well with smoking, motor vehicles, and accidents. I'm sorry, smoking, motor vehicles, and alcohol. We could do better with alcohol. We're not doing well with obesity, poisonings, or firearms, and we could be doing better with those. Well, how can we affect public health change? What is a useful way to modify structure so that we can change individual behaviors? This is a cartoon of how water was drawn for use in many households in London, which is one of the you know, biggest and richest cities on earth at the time, actually it still is, in the middle of the 19th century. So in many parts of London, in 1854, you would go to a pump and you would move this pump handle to bring up water in buckets and pitchers that you would take home for your uh, use. And this is a very, very famous classic piece of data analysis performed by John Snow in the middle of the 19th century. There was an outbreak of cholera that occurred in the Soho district of London 
in and around Broad Street in 1854. And some elements of this story are disputed, but I'm gonna tell you the conventional version. Jon Snow reasoned, at the time there was a big debate about what caused cholera. Some people thought it floated through the air in a kind of miasma or mist. And Jon Snow reasoned that if cholera was in fact spread by a mist or miasma, as the prevailing theories then suggested, then the cases should be uniformly distributed along the streets. And to see if this was the case, he plotted each cholera case on a map. So here is the relevant region of London and for each household. So here's a household facing the street. There's another household. There's another household and another one 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 and, another one and so forth. He puts a little black line for each case of cholera. So for example, this household here had four cases of cholera and this one had two cases and here there were no cases. This was either a big household or some kind of apartment building and had lots of cases. And he plots all the cases in this area to just see what's the geographic distribution of cholera of cases. And as can be seen, these cases are not uniformly distributed, but instead form a tight cluster near this pump, near this water pump located on Broad Street. And Snow then did something else. He didn't just notice that, oh, there's a lot of cases near the Broad Street pump. He then went, he took a water sample from the Broad Street pump and under a microscope, he saw that there were bacteria, cholera bacteria, which have a very distinctive appearance under a microscope. I've seen them under a microscope, Vibrio cholera, that he had never seen before. And he guessed that these little microscopic organisms must be causing the cholera. And then he did something that was miraculously famous. He went back to Broad Street and he removed the handle from the pump, preventing people from uh, taking water from that pump anymore. And the cholera outbreak stopped overnight. This is the very origin of the very famous saying that he took the handle off the Broad Street pump. When public health experts speak about this, they speak with a kind of weepy reverence. Wouldn't it be amazing if there were other things we could do where we could take the handle off the Broad Street pump and stop people from dying in our society, from guns or tobacco or obesity or, or all of the other kind of public health problems we've been discussing. It would be great if we could have a handle on the Broad Street pump for so many of our collective threats that we've been reviewing. And in many cases, we actually do. We can address the structure and not just the agency. This here is uh, the Jon Snow pub in England. Uh, and uh, there's a little, uh, where is it? I can't, I can't see where it's uh, mounted. Uh, there's a little uh, red granite curbstone, uh, which marks the site of the historic Broad Street pump associated with Dr. Jon Snow's discovery in 1854 that cholera was conveyed by water. And we can address the structure for so many threats. When it comes to accidents, we can think about roadway design. When it comes to smoking, we can think about how cigarettes are marketed. When it comes to firearm deaths, we can think about gun availability. When it comes to obesity, we can think about school lunches, soft drink machines in elementary schools, the design of our cities, and so much else besides, not the least of which is our social norms. Let me see if I can, uh, there we go. Hold on. Stop share. No, I wanna stop sharing. Did I stop sharing or I didn't? Hold on, Maggie. Uh, let's see here. All right. I'm still sharing the screen, right? Yeah, give me one second here. Why will it not? There we go. Okay, we have a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions about what we've been discussing the last two classes before we move on to new topics?
Are you learning? Go ahead, Severin. Oh. You learning? Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a minor question about an earlier slide. Uh, you had mentioned that there was a different statistical significance between having a strong ordinance and a ban in a community with uh, respect to, oh man, I forget now. I don't think that was firearms. I think that, was that debate, is, that detail is probably something I won't remember offhand either. There's some tiny detail about whether or, one kind of ordinance worked better than some other approach. What, what isn't, or, like what's the difference between a strong ordinance and a ban? Well, I don't know precisely in that article, but I would imagine a ban is like, you know, if we if uh, if we pass a rule that says that you simply cannot go out unmasked versus we, you know, we say at all versus we say you can't um, go into restaurants and bars, for example, unmasked, something like that, I would assume. I don't know the answer precisely. Anything else? Yes, uh, Ayman. Uh, I was wondering, uh, with the previous two slides, you mentioned that uh, with driving, with the shift from blaming drivers to blaming vehicles, it was a shift from the agency of structure. And similarly, with carbon monoxide, after changing uh, the way that carbon monoxide is produced and uh, adding catalytic converters, that it was a structural support. Uh, is this a, an example of changing this, of changing this structure? I wasn't sure if you were trying to uh, convey that it was similar to the case of cholera. My question yes. is- Yes, the idea is that, this idea is like taking the handle off the Broad Street pump is the analogy there. That, that metaphor is a metaphor for removing the carbon monoxide from the natural gas. So yes. we can't stop people from thinking about killing themselves, but we can make it hard for them to do so. Or like the opening example in the course of putting the suicide nets, we can't necessarily stop people from jumping. You know, They have agency, but we can put suicide nets to catch them. And then you know try to you know save their lives. Thank you. Did I answer the question? Meanwhile, you've got a totally dope uh, microphone set up there. I just want to comment. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Okay, guys. See you next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.